Hey everyone, this is Nick and I'm back from my vacation, now enjoying some rain after two weeks of sun. And we have a lot to talk about. This week we have Chrome OS moving to the real Linux stack with Wayland, regular Linux graphics and splitting Chrome from the main system, which means it might be turning into a real Linux distro soon and also probably more contributions to the rest of the Linux stack. We also have Linux Mint discussing how they're gonna approach their relationship with Ubuntu as a base in the future. And we have Gnome testing a replacement for the Activities button. And we also have the usual driver related news for more battery life, some gaming news and a lot more. And we also have this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare and if you don't know who they are, they're basically offering a wide range of services like extended lifecycle support for distros or life patching to ensure that your Linux server or workstation fleet is always up to date and secure with minimum downtime. And this time they're offering you a free guide titled The Bugs Behind the Vulnerabilities. It details the most common software bugs and some handy tips to know what to look for when developing a new product or feature or just reviewing and analyzing code to avoid creating or to help detecting vulnerabilities. This guide is free to download and will give you everything you need to know about the top 25 most dangerous software weaknesses of 2022, what they look like in code samples and some coding principles you can apply to ensure you avoid vulnerabilities as much as possible. So if you write code or if you review someone else's code, click the link in the description below and grab the free guide. So is Chrome OS a Linux distro in the usual sense of the term? Probably not, but it could be in the future. Google plans to split the Chrome browser from the base of Chrome OS with a project called Lacros for Linux and Chrome OS. With this, they will split the Linux based operating system from the releases of Chrome that basically currently powers everything you're doing in that system. The system UI, the taskbar, the window manager, everything else is handled by the web browser and it's just one binary handling all of this. The new design would split this with the system UI running its own binary and process and the browser running separately as well. The new project will also take Chrome OS away from its own graphics stack and run it on Wayland on top of the usual Linux stack. Something that feels like it should have been the default years ago, as there is no real reason to duplicate this kind of intensive work. Finally, Chrome OS would move away from its own Google Chrome and just use the regular Linux version of Chrome you can already use. Something that might generate more attention from Google towards better Linux support. Build 1.16 of Chrome OS will implement all of this by default, when previously you needed to use a specific flag to try it out. In terms of UI and general use of Chrome OS, users will probably not notice any changes for now, but it should make Chrome OS way easier to develop in the future with a system UI that moves faster and probably a better browsing experience as well. So yeah, Chrome OS would basically turn into a real Linux distro using a real Linux stack running a proprietary user interface and a proprietary browser. I still would not use it for all the money in the world because I value my privacy, but for people who don't quite care about this, having this closer to a real Linux system would be good and it probably also means more efforts from Google to actually better support drivers and hardware on Linux. Now on top of the new window management features that GNOME is working on for a future release with some kind of auto positioning of windows, something I will call auto floating. They also want to test another change, replacing the activities label in the top bar with something a bit more explicit in terms of virtual desktops. They have a new extension that you have to install manually that will replace the text activities with a representation of your virtual desktops. Each desktop is a dot and the one you're currently on is a longer pill. As you move between desktops, the indicator moves along to represent which desktop is currently in focus and letting you know what you have to the right and to the left of the current desktop. Basically, it's a pager widget like we've used in GNOME and KDE and other desktops for a while, but in a symbolic fashion and baked in GNOME by default. Now, clicking this indicator, of course, will still bring the activities view, but at least you will get a visual representation of your current desktop layout. 
If you want to try things out, you can download the extension and install it and give GNOME devs your feedback. I can already see a few inconsistencies between the on-screen display at the bottom of the screen when changing workspaces and the new proposed top element. And I'm not personally sure that it's more understandable as a button than the activities text. It also seems to remove the application name menu, which admittedly is now completely useless and holds no interesting action, apart from letting the user know which window is currently focused. It looks nice and is probably a better visual representation of what you're getting when you click on that activities button, but I don't think it's that much more legible as a button than the activities text. So we'll have to see. If you want to try it out, install it, give the GNOME devs your feedback, and maybe they'll implement it like this, or maybe they'll improve it along the lines. Who knows? They do user testing. The Linux Mint team shared some details about the upcoming new release of Linux Mint 21.3 planned for December, but also on how they will handle their relationship with Ubuntu as a base. So some of the big planned changes in the future are fixing Secure Boot, but also assessing Wayland to see how much work there is to be done for its what they call potential adoption. A choice of words that might lead one to think that there's a choice in the matter where there's really not in the future they're gonna have to support Wayland. They're also working on what they call an Edge ISO, which is the exact same Linux Mint you know, but with a newer kernel, so it works on more recent hardware compared to the relatively old base of Mint. They also talked about their relationship with Ubuntu and their plans. Mint 21.3 will still be based on Ubuntu 22.04, but in 2024, the new Ubuntu LTS will be out, and it's probably going to rely on Snap a lot more than previous releases, which will lead the Mint team to look at the quality of their package base to see if they still want to use Ubuntu as their base. Now, reading between the lines, you get the feeling they don't really want to move away from Ubuntu, but that they will do so if it becomes too much work to fix what they don't like with the Ubuntu base. Clément Lefebvre, the founder of Linux Mint, also asked people to stop being so negative about Ubuntu and to stay civil when discussing which base should be used as the default. It's a nice reminder that it's not exactly super easy to ditch Ubuntu as a base and go all in on the Debian edition. As much as I don't really like what Ubuntu is turning into with snaps and various weird corpo decisions from Canonical, you can't deny that they do a lot for user friendliness out of the box. And if Mint ditched Ubuntu as a base for Debian, for example, they would have to re-implement a lot of that stuff themselves, something they probably already do in the Debian edition, but it always comes out a lot later than the Ubuntu release. Now, the Azahi Linux project, which you might have heard of if you follow along the Linux support for Apple Silicon Macs, they announced a new offshoot, which is Fedora Azahi Remix. In short, it's Fedora, but with all the hardware enablements that Azahi includes to run on M1 and M2 Macs, whether they're laptops or desktops. And of course, it's just early steps. You do have an ISO you can download and use, but they say it's not ready and will probably break a lot. It's more to get started on integrating all the work Azahi does into other distributions, as that's their main goal, upstreaming all their work as soon as it's ready and stable enough and probably keeping Azahi as the bleeding edge testing grounds for newer Apple Silicon hardware. The official release of Fedora Azahi Remix will be at the end of August, and it is based on some init scripts that are already in Fedora's repos and a set of copper repos now served from Fedora's infrastructure. And since I'm done using macOS on my M1 MacBook Pro, I just used it for a few videos, I'm ready to replace it with either Azahi Linux or Azahi Fedora Remix or whatever they call it. Maybe I'll do a video comparing the two and letting people decide if it's ready enough for them and which distro they should focus on. We also have a bunch of KDE related news this week, first with an update on the Plasma 6 roadmap. Apparently everything is proceeding as planned with almost all the porting tasks done including all SVG elements, using Kirigami, modernizing the Plasmoid APIs, and moving the actions in the system settings pages to the header of the app. There's still some backend work for the KDE frameworks on which most KDE apps are based, but these changes should streamline a lot of things, especially in the visual department with icon themes now being used throughout the whole system without a hitch, something that wasn't always perfect in Plasma. 
Now the developers can focus on implementing the remaining planned features and polishing things up. And if you want to test Plasma 6 already, there's a new branch of KDE Neon called Neon Experimental, which gives you just that, all the latest Plasma 6 developments Obviously not a stable thing to be used daily by most people, but a cool, easy testing ground. And looking at the Plasma 6 wiki, there are a lot of interesting features for Plasma 6, including a power profile OSD, time zone conversions in KRunner, basic opt-in support for HDR, and a lot more. So I'm really excited to test this out on a spare laptop, of course. Now, as per GNOME, there was some profiling going on to find areas where GNOME components aren't as fast as they should be. And this resulted in reduced overhead and startup time for a lot of GNOME shell search providers, which means GNOME should be faster and use less resources out of the box. This work is also ongoing for some GNOME apps like Nautilus, GNOME Photos or the Calculator. In terms of apps, Parabolic, the video downloader, now lets you select the items you want to download from a playlist. There's Daikan, a new media player for audio and video, now out in alpha on Flathub. It does look pretty good. There's also Cavalier or Cavalier, an audio visualization app, which now lets you set a background image and can be controlled from the command line. And you can also set the FPS you want. And finally, Solar, the Logitech peripheral management app, now has a GNOME extension, so Solar now supports all its features on Wayland, assuming you install the latest version of the app manually, or alternatively, you can wait for it to land in your distro's repos. And I just love to see these improvements to performance and startup times, because GNOME, while it runs really well on recent hardware, can be a bit on the heavy side on older computers, and so, well, having it being more efficient and saving some CPU cycles is always good, and you're also getting better battery life in the process, which is also pretty nice. And we also have a bunch of driver-related updates this week. First with Mesa 23.2, the drivers for AMD and Intel GPUs, which now are also used to support Apple Silicon integrated graphics. The new release brings better support for a wide variety of games on RDNA 3 GPUs from AMD, so the 7000 series, plus support for OpenGL 3.1, and OpenGL ES 3.0 on Azahi, so on Apple Silicon Max. We also have some news about the CPU power utility in the Linux kernel 6.6, .6, which will now enable support for AMD P states. This means that AMD CPUs will be able to more easily change their state between passive, active and guided autonomous, and will generally be more efficient and use less power, which should result in better battery life. CPU frequency scaling and turbo boosting are also improved along the way. And these improvements were already accessible, but not easily for users and user space tools. So now various desktop environments and apps might be able to take better advantage of them to save power. And it looks like there's a lot of efficiency and battery life focused work on Linux these days, which is really awesome to see. I can't wait to get a kernel that packs all of this in so I can finally have decent battery life on my Linux laptops. And let's finish this with the gaming news. First, we have the Linux market share on Steam growing again to almost 2%, now being higher than macOS. 1.96% of Steam users that took the Steam survey use Linux, which is a huge jump from the previous month. SteamOS and Holo ISO are obviously in the lead with 42% of Linux users, followed by Arch and Ubuntu at around 8% and 7.5% respectively. AMD CPUs represent 69% of the Linux gaming hardware. Nice, and also really nice. Well, obviously it's from the Steam Deck, which uses an AMD APU, but it's still awesome to see that Linux is now basically the second biggest platform for gaming on PC. But we also have another example of how Linux gaming can be really cool, but also really unstable, with an Ubisoft Connect update that broke the launcher on Linux, making Ubisoft games unplayable for a while. This is the unstable part, where developers just don't care about their stuff on Linux. And the awesome part comes from Valve, fixing the problem almost immediately in Proton Experimental, which restored support for the launcher. And let me just say this, launchers suck, and this includes Steam. I wish we could still just buy games individually and just use Proton or Wine or whatever else to run them individually. Being tied to a launcher that doesn't necessarily support your platform just 
sucks and it just reinforces the monopoly and the fact that you don't really own your games. What you can own though is a device from today's sponsor. Tuxedo makes laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. They're actually made specifically to support Linux. The hardware is picked because it has great Linux support. And if some pieces are not exactly perfect, Tuxedo actually contributes fixes and patches and drivers to the Linux kernel to fix all of that. They have a big range of devices that should cover every need and every price point. Whether you need a laptop, a desktop, something in between, something for gaming, for work, something lightweight, they have everything. And all their devices are very customizable with plenty of options for CPU, RAM, SSD, GPUs. And you can also set your own logo on the lid of your laptop, choose your own keyboard layout. They ship to most countries in the world and all their laptops are openable, repairable and upgradable. So if you need a new computer and you plan to run Linux on it, and you also want to support Linux's development and hardware support, click the link in the description below and buy yourself a tuxedo device. They're really, really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications and to write a comment. And if you didn't, there's always that thumbs down button as well. And if you really enjoyed the channel, there are plenty of links in the description below to help you support it. You know how this works. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.